Hello, and welcome to the Level Cap Podcast with me, your co-host, D. Brad Talton Jr. I'm joined by the wonderful, splendiferous, otherwise, Marco! And otherwise... Level Cap Podcast is filmed before a live studio audience in Albuquerque, New Mexico. No, wait, no, that's not true. Half of it is filmed in um, Bonifacio Global City, Philippines. Whoa, whoa, are you filming this, Marco? Um, I am now. No, I don't think so. No, see, no. only one of these has recorded video. That's me. Are you serious? Are you recording your video right now? No, not really. <laughs> Okay. He called my bluff. He called my bluff, Marco. Aha. The next thing you're going to say is it was a bluff. Well, I already said that. Aha. I have the reverse power. I can tell you things that have already happened. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Battle historian Marco. Ah, oh, yes. You... This is your, your new shonen power because you can know the past and his because you know history and history always repeats itself. You effectively know the future. Then oh, you shoot the basketball and turn invisible. <laughs> <laughs> because in I have read about the basketball turning invisible. Therefore, I too can turn the basketball invisible. It's it's troubling that we're still talking about this two weeks later. I can't I believe. Saying. I mean, like, <laughs> I can't get over it. It's 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 now literally in like my top ten most favorite manga anime just because of how absurd it is. It's not it's not like excellent in terms of writing, but like. Oh, man. I'll never find something as absurd ever again. Oh, man. All right. Well, let's focus up. Let's get, let's get into it. All right. Talk about, talk about what we've been doing. Okay. Um, Brad, let me ask you on our first segment, what have you been doing? Well, I've been doing a lot of playing board games. More. I got to play Wasteland Express. Ooh, okay. I got to play Charterstone. Charterstone. I played... Fortress, the new Friedman Fries fast forward games. Mm-hmm. Um, what else have I played recently? Those are the most those are the most memorable things that I played recently. So mm. a lot of board gaming in the in recent memory. So among all of them, which one's like your fave? Uh, definitely Charterstone was my favorite of the ones I played uh, recently. So can you tell me a bit more about Charterstone? Is it Related yeah. to Hearthstone? Of course not. But no, like. it's not. Uh, it's, this is by Stonemaier Games. Um, same guys make Scythe. It's their legacy game. Ah. It is... Um, I would say it's like a cube converter type game. Like, you go to the place, you get the resource, you go to another place, you turn the resource into a different resource or VPs. You're racing with the other players to do this as efficiently as possible, and whenever a player goes to the space that you're on, they kick you off and then you pick your piece back up and you get to take extra actions. If nobody kicks your pieces off, then you've got to do a recall where you manually pull back all your pieces and take a whole turn. That uh, is the, the basics of the game. It's, mm. uh, it's pretty cool. I've been enjoying it. Uh, we're probably going to play it again uh, either today or, or over the weekend sometime. What's the legacy aspect? So the legacy aspect is one of the things you can do in the town is build more buildings. And those buildings are stickers that go on the board and provide you new ways to convert your cubes um, or oh. do other actions. So now now in game two, um, we uh, we have new workers that we can get called minions. So slight spoiler alert for you guys. Like Chartstone. bananas? Sorry. Banana. I, don't think it's, I don't think it's a big spoiler that in a worker placement game you get more workers. Surprise. Oh, Brad, what if it was a spoiler? Well, it was a spoiler. I just said that, but it's not a big spoiler, so you have to forgive me. All right. Okay. I forgive you, Brad, from the bottom of my heart and from the Thanks, bottom of Marco. my feet. Cool. I'll send you a. Uh, I'll send you a copy of Charterstone to bury the hatchet. <laughs> nah, just bury the pratchet. Oh, yeah. have you read any? Have you read any uh, Discworld yet? Have I read any Discworld yet? No, not yet. Sadly, where, where can I? Are like, are they available? Uh, what do you call this on like Kindles and stuff? I'm sure. I'm I'm sure they are, and I'm sure you can get them on audiobook too. I should probably just get audiobooks. Type. I just. I, I mean, should. you take the trains every morning, right? So I don't take trains the, in the morning. No? no. Oh, I thought you had. I thought you had a long commute. 
Oh, yeah, sorry, okay. Cultural differences. In the Philippines, when you say commute, that means literally getting from point A to point B, no matter what way. So it can be a drive, you could walk, you could take a jeep. You what, so how a... do you get there? So I sometimes drive, and sometimes... Driving I... and taking a jeep are generally considered the same thing, by the way. No, no, okay, so another cultural difference, a jeep is a mode of public transportation in the Philippines. What? Yes. Like a taxi, or like... Like, it's just a different thing altogether. Imagine, like, a bus, but it works like a taxi. That's just called a bus. N- no, no, That's no. That's what buses do. No, it, but buses don't stop whenever you want, and they don't pick you up wherever you are. They're bus stops, right? Jeeps are uh, buses that don't have bus stops. Okay. So they just go along a certain path, and then you just hail them, and then ride... And then when you want to get off, you like, you know, shout at the driver and then you get off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, um, no, we have those in America. Uh, I can't remember, but I think, I think they're just called, I think we just call them, uh, gosh, what are they called? I think they're called, uh, P2P buses. No. Because they go, they go point to point. I see. Okay. That means Uh, an entirely different thing. Place to place. Oh, that means an entirely different thing where I'm from too. Point to point well, means... Could be, I could be wrong entirely. I haven't, point... I haven't seen one of these since college. So. I see. Well, a Jeep, also it's called a Jeep because they're made after... Um, like when the US was here during like World War II, I think, they left a bunch of Jeeps. So some of the Filipinos <laughs> actually took the Jeeps and repurposed them into that. And then the uh-huh. modern Jeeps are just derivatives of those old Jeeps they had okay. back then. Now, let me ask you, is this... When you say Jeep, are these made by the Jeep company or are they just called jeeps for reasons that that you know historic reasons oh second one because they're not no because there's not there's not even like a model make of a jeep like all of them are made in garages at homes like that's just how they work it's it's atrocious okay but anyway huh. anyway 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 so um i i really should listen to some more Discworld. um you know I'll probably just buy it on audible or something mm-hmm. yeah okay and also, I just realized that yeah, was a really it's bad good. joke. It's really I, good. I that was a really what? bad joke. I'm sorry, everyone. Oh man, it's horrible. What? What's that? You said bury the hatchet, and I was like bury the pratchet, and I'm like, oh no, he's actually gone. Oh. Oh man, Marco, let's not speak. Uh, let's not. Let's That's make bad. Jibes at the. I'm at sorry. The departed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, like, I just heard hatchet. And I was like, oh yeah, we were talking about super, Terry Pratchett. Super bad. Super bad. Super I, bad. I don't even know if I don't even know if I can podcast with you anymore, Marco. Oh no, I'm Someone sorry. Makes a joke like that. That right. wasn't a joke. Wow. I was just like, hey, you were like Terry Pratchett. Uh, you were like bury the hatchet. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We were talking about Terry Pratchett in See, the previous episode. My opinion, episodes. my opinion used to be up here of you, Marco, but now it's like it's like down here. Oh man, I I can't even see that, but I just know it's way lower. <sighs> oh yeah, man, like like I, I like you can't even tell. Like I have to go under my desk to get get my hand low enough. Oh no, for, for, uh. for the lows that you've reached. Let's see if you can redeem yourself. Okay. Um, with with, with what, what I've been doing? been doing. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I I don't think I'll be able to redeem myself. I think this episode is just like Marco falls from grace because um what oh, I've no. been doing is playing Hearthstone. <laughs> Um, yep, yep. So they just recently released the new Witchwood expansion, and I'm not really a kind of person who um, buys packs. I'm not that kind of guy, you know. If I had money, I will spend it on more board games because you know <laughs> the value of board games is always immensely better. Um, but yeah, I I found that like I found out that there's a deck list that's just basically. Hey, you can just kind of autopilot this and then like sometimes kill people because apparently there's a new version of like aggro face hunter. So I was like, yes, all right, this is literally all oh, I will no. play. So Marco, Marco, yeah, I'm not redeeming myself. I'm literally just, hey, let's put Baku, the Moon Eater. Like first, it's first is Hearthstone, but now it's face hunter Hearthstone. Yes, like, exactly. It's like it just gets worse and worse and worse. Uh, next, I'm gonna tell yeah. you that. You know, for 99 questions, I only picked one question and, and blah, blah, blah. Um, no, but seriously, though, um, one thing I want to point out <laughs> about this new Hearthstone expansion um, that only a few people might notice is that 
um, one of the iconic legendaries in the set, and specifically the legendary that enables this face hunter deck, is called Baku the Moon Eater. And this is a Hearthstone original card. So apparently they're adding Hearthstone original cards now because I think they're running out of the cards from the original WoW TCG. So um, yeah, they may be running out of characters from Warcraft too. Oh yeah, like literally. So they added this new character called Baku the Moon Eater, and this art's pretty cool because he's like a giant snake dragon thing. Uh, and uh-huh. he's and like it basically he looks like he's coiled around an entire village like that's what he looks like he's pretty cool okay I'm gonna have to look up this thing oh man yeah he does look super cool yeah so um one thing I want to talk about this card is not mechanics or anything it's about the name so um uh-huh. Baku the Moon Eater is actually a reference to Filipino mythology. So that's, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, so this is like I think the first time I've seen Filipino mythology um, referenced in Warcraft. Um, so Baku the Moon Eater is actually named after the Bakunawa, or um, yeah, the Bakunawa, which is a Filipino mythological dragon who is our mythological story for explaining why eclipses happen, because he. Hmm. he Bakunawa comes out and he literally swallows the moon, which is why eclipses happen. Oh, huh. That's pretty cool. Yeah, so that's why that's why the card's called Baku, the Moon Eater. So, yeah, that's a little bit of trivia for me. I, I felt really, really cool that this card was there because I was like, ah, oh, this is a cool card. Until I looked at the name and I was like, wait a minute. That's, <laughs> that's oh. So, you know, that kind of solidified me instantly crafting that card and i guess as a side effect i was like yeah okay i guess i have to play face hunter now so did i redeem myself or not with like cool that's that's pretty cool i i guess with a cool cultural a cool cultural slash historical fact you managed to redeem yourself yes yes i have not fallen completely from grace oh my gosh but aside from that i've also not yet um, there's still more episode to go okay aside from that i've been playing some more BattleCon online Uh uh-huh uh-huh Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that's definitely points in the right direction. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, How are you enjoying BCO these days? Um, I'm mixed. I'm kind of um, on a losing streak. My current win, uh, my current global win rate is thirty eight percent. Oh no! Yeah, it's because I keep playing Riflum. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've made it my oh. sole mission to like figure out this character right like this is the hardest character in the game to play and i don't care if you say like you have infinite amount of games it's still pretty tough to figure out a new character and i say quote unquote new character because we recently just buffed riflum right uh we mm-hmm. changed install to be end of beat instead of uh on hit which is like mm, choice chef kiss um so uh i've been trying to figure out like a way to make it work Sadly, I have not figured it out, but here's my redeeming moment, Brad. Yesterday, okay. I ended my lose streak. I was like on seven or eight losses at that point. But you were like, you said you were on a lose streak. So yeah, you, yeah. You were, you were recently on a losing streak. Sorry, sorry. My not mistake. anymore. Okay, okay. Grammar. Well, okay. We're not going to be sorry for you now. Ugh. No. Points down no, for no. grammar. I guess, I guess. Yep. Okay, it goes down. Grammar goes down. Um, but yeah, I, I I just ended my losing streak yesterday, uh, and it was great. It was against a Mikhail, so that was a pretty okay. interesting game. Yeah, I was like, you know, that's not a very good matchup for Riffle. What I what I find is pretty neat is that like each new character that we release one by one is changing the meta in their own way. Oh, so true. Yeah. That was so true for Marmalee, and um, I'm yeah. not sure how true it is for Mikhail just yet because I haven't seen him around a lot, but. Yeah, uh, it's. Well, I got knocked out of the tournament. Oh, really? You did? Yeah, I did. I did. Oh no! Oh no! One of the uh, one of the the guy that beat me though, he's in Final Four. Uh, so we'll is see it where, mix? Where they go? Was it mix? Uh, L- Linne, Linne beat me. Oh man, what what who yeah. who were they running? Um, it was. Um, let's see. I banned Kalistar. I remember that because I definitely didn't want to play against Kalistar after my first match. Because Cal Star ruined me there. Yes, yes. Uh, who who did they play? Uh, oh, Luke. They beat me with Luke. It was it was just man. It was so bad. I mean, I I, I know I made a misplay or two, but I felt like it was like I just okay. Luke versus Marmalee is still pretty tough. 
Luke's got a lot of stuns. Oh man, Flash. You know, Flash Memento. is mega scary. And, oh my uh, gosh. Memento. Memento. Yeah, and Memento just hits for six pretty consistently, and um, it's it's tough to it's tough to guard against that. Tough but bean. Anyway, uh, you know, it was a lot of fun to play in the tournament, and I am looking forward to doing more. One of the things that I felt playing the tournament is that we really got to we have really got to make more. What's the word I'm looking for? Reduce the latency of this game. You know, like there's a lot of wait times and I want to reduce the wait times down. So we've got some plans in motion for that with our next update. Uh, wait times are going to go down and the, um, uh, what else also, we're going to be implementing AI, uh, hopefully in the next update. We'll see. Is there an option to speed up um, animations? Uh, currently not, but it's it's a thing we could consider if we still feel the game's too slow. I mean, at some point you've got to wait on your opponent, and if they choose to watch animations, then animations are going to get are going to happen. Yeah, I guess. Well, my Shonen Power is not needing animations, so um, yeah, huh. yeah. The board game didn't have animations. Yeah, the board game. Back in my day, Battlegon had no animations. Your kids are so spoiled. Okay, Yu-Gi-Oh! Bridge series. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My hair, attention duelists, my hair wants us to move to the next segment. Oh me, oh my. All right, well, um, yeah, let's talk about, um, let's talk about production, what we're, what we're working on these days, because that's what we're doing. Mostly, okay, so these days, it's all Imperial, all the time, like every day, you wake up, Imperial, you go to sleep, it's more Imperial tomorrow. Do you it's live, breathe, eat, and like live Imperial uh yes if 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 you intended to say live twice then yes yes that, no i, I intended life fully intended because yes. it seems that it imperial yes imperial um so you could st- say that spells in steam run through your veins you could say such a thing yes okay so tell, the, tell uh, me more about what you've been doing with imperial brad i mean you talked to us about the gameplay mechanics last episode so what's this episode going to be about so this episode we are continuing on with um <clears throat> with mostly promotion. So I'm scheduling meetings with uh, various reviewers, uh, you know, people of, uh, of influence in the board game industry, and we are sitting down playing Imperial, getting their opinions. Um, I'm still playtesting a couple mechanics. Uh, we've got a few more things to figure out um, with the variants in the game, some of the expansion content, and also we are working really hard to get all of the characters balanced. And so to that end, um, and this will be the first that I've mentioned this, but to, well, actually, when you hear this, it will have been mentioned a week ago, but this will be the first time I'm mentioning it on in my person. But oh, yes. anyway, yes. yeah, time current. shenanigans aside. Th- time shenanigans, current Brad is different from future Brad, so yeah. so far. But the, so what it is, is we are opening playtesting for Imperial, and we would <sighs> like you to join us, playtest Imperial, uh, jot down your results. Games of Imperial that you complete are going to be worth 50 organized play points apiece. And, 50? Um, wow. If you... Well, it's, it's not a short game, right? And if you play 10 games, then we will upgrade your Kickstarter pledge from basic to deluxe edition at no extra charge. So Whoa. you get like a $40 pledge upgrade if you play 10 games of Imperial and, and record them in our playtesting you know, suite to help us uh, help us balance the game. What? Yep. Oh my gosh, Brad, you are literally giving money away. But wait, there's more. Is there more? Please say there's more. No, that was everything. There's no more. Oh no. I um, details are on the website, so check it out. Yay! Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I can't wait to play more Imperial because um, I don't know. I don't know how to explain this to you, Brad, but. I feel that Imperial is a very fun game. Is that is that fair to say? Have, I you, played, even... have you played Imperial? No, I yeah. have not played. You've because... just been watching us play it? Yeah, I mean, I've been watching some of you guys well, play you it. Well, you need I've to join, you need join one of our games. Cause, so, so that's my life. Is like I get up, uh, I usually have an afternoon game of Imperial with somebody. Um, and then, or except on my playtesting days, Tuesday and Thursday. But every other day of the week, I've had an Imperial game in the afternoon. And then in the evening times, I have another Imperial game podcast 
showing the game to um, another publishing company to do international language editions, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I could talk a little bit about kind of what the process is for um, for a couple of different things. One of the things that's interesting that we're doing with this game is that the whole game is an iconography. There's no text on the cards. Oh, and wow. So Are we going to turn uh, into that one game that we were talking about? Uh, with Race for the Galaxy, what's it called? Um, no, no, it's not, it's not ridiculous icons. Um, but the, the icons are, are pretty straightforward. And the only components that need to change between editions are the box and the rule books. You can have native language text. So we're, we're sharing the game with a bunch of international companies. We've talked to people in China, Japan, Germany, Italy, Spain, Portugal, uh, trying to get different language editions um, of Imperial made uh, at the same time. So when you print games, right, if you print like 2,000 copies, you don't get a very good economy. Games are like twice as expensive, maybe three times as expensive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But if you print the game at 5,000 quantity, then you get a much better deal. And if you print the game at 10,000 quantity, you get a really good deal. That's about where they level off until you get to like the 100,000s. So if we can bring in more companies that want to print alongside us, we can make the game cheaper for everybody by printing those components which are shared among the games multiple times. Does Uh, that make sense? Okay, okay. So like by having those icons without text, you can essentially mass produce those. And then yeah. when you need to localize, it's all just the specific textbook instead. Right. So if I only need 1, 000, like 5,000 copies, but the Chinese company wants 2,000, and the Portuguese company wants 2,000, and the German company wants 2,000, then we make a 10,000 or 11,000 game print run, and we all save money. Um, so that helps us to bring the game to our fans at a cheaper rate. Huh. Yeah. Okay, and that's uh, and that's how that's one way that things are done in the industry because a lot of companies, it's it's an expensive job to actually like make a board game, right? You got to do a ton of art, ton of graphic design, takes months, and then um, you put it all together, logistics, press press direction, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a lot of companies just want to buy a game and then put it on the market and sell it, and that is. Um, and so, and so that's that's cool. It's, it gives us something to work with, so that a company like us that does take on all these production costs has a second outlet to, you know, to recoup those costs other than just selling the games. Mm, yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, how many yeah. uh, countries do we like? Like in your perfect world, how many countries are you going to get? Which ones, rather, are you going to get? In the perfect world, all of them. Okay. In the realistic but ideal world. Um, I'm hoping for like like uh, three or four could join us. Like I said, if three or four buy two thousand copies, then that really increases the size of the print run we can do in a great way, and it'll it'll put us on that next tier of cheaper pricing. Mm, okay, so if if that does happen, um, what do you call this? Will it actually affect the MSRP or our SRP? Yeah, it it will affect the MSRP, and for Imperial. Affecting the MSRP means actually letting this game go to retail. Um, game is pretty expensive. It's like nine pounds. It is nine about, pounds. Yeah. That's like laptop more than laptops heavy, man. So so here's the thing, right? You, when you make it the MSRP for a game, you want to charge about five to seven times what it costs you to produce the game. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, it should be like five times your total landed cost, which for Imperial. Um, if we're only printing 3,000 of these games, our total landed cost is going to be something along the lines of $27. Uh, dollars, I'm right? sorry, Brad, what's so, landed cost? Okay, so it's the cost of production plus the cost of shipping the game, the cost of getting the game to your doorstep. Oh, landed. Plus any taxes, fees, yeah. So that's what we call it. Like the cost is just the cost of production. But the landed cost is the cost of actually getting the product onto your doorstep mm. or to the customer's doorstep. Okay. Okay. So, so yeah. So when the project runs, um, so the the actual like with three thousand, the actual land cost of a game of Imperial is like twenty seven dollars or so, twenty eight dollars, and so that means that the um, retail edition needs to be about one hundred and thirty dollars. Oh my, game. that's yeah, pretty it's, pricey. It's pretty pricey, right? I don't think we would actually offer it. It'd be online exclusive at that point. Um, but if you print ten thousand copies. The landed cost goes down to about sixteen dollars, which means you can offer the game at eighty. Oh my god! Millennium Blades. That's yeah, like so it fifty off. These, 
pretty much yeah i mean it's 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 a significant chunk of change right but that's that's be, it's because everything gets magnified so much right every dollar that we save in production we can knock five dollars off the msrp yeah okay it's kind of like um exponential savings or something mm-hmm. like that yeah my so gosh it's a, it's a big deal to um to be able to do that that kind of thing to work with other companies and to reduce all of our costs because if I print three thousand and then they print three thousand and then the next guy prints three thousand, we all have to pay that twenty eight dollar fee. But if we all get together and print ten thousand, then we all pay the eighteen dollar fee. Right. Oh. So it's it's like it's you know, this like mutual beneficence which among all of the uh the cooperators. And with that, um the world was once again saved by the power of cooperation. We'd like yeah. to call this uh, 20 collaborating. Um, that's, that's what I call this. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't even know what you're talking about, Marco. Uh, 2018. 2018. Tw- 2018. Uh, well, just call it the year of collaboration. Oh. Ah, 2018, was... the year of collusion, because it's Millennium Blade's collusion that's coming out this year. Oh, right. Oh, man. So much stuff is coming out. So um, what do yeah, you expect yeah. the Imperial Kids It's really not to... that much stuff. I said like four games, that's it this whole year. Well, okay, there's going to be a little more than four, but four major releases this year. I hope we hit all of them. Brad, that's, uh, that's where we're at. Yeah. You're saying, quote unquote, only four. It's, that's still a lot. Like, that's a lot, right? Or is it not a lot? You know what? When it comes it's to like. It's not a lot when you consider that like one of them is, is just the update edition of Devastation, right? And the other one we've been working on for like two and a half years, the Seventh Cross. Um, so I, I don't, I mean, I think it's doable, but we do have to work hard. It takes a lot of work to put together a big box game with this many moving parts. And Imperial has shown us that like, um, there's so much stuff in the game, like, uh, you know, just, just, and figuring out like how all these pieces fit together in the box and, you know, how much it all weighs, how much you got to charge for shipping, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. All that, uh, it, it can get complex, but I know we have a team that can handle it. So I know we could do it uh, as long as we crack down, hit our deadlines, and um, you know, and make the game work, and have the power of friendship. Yes. Yeah, friendship is what makes it all possible. Oh my gosh! Yep. it's a good thing. It's every good... time, uh, every time uh, we we complete a game, the world gets a little bit meaner. <laughs> Why does it get meaner? Oh, because you use up because the friendship. we're using we're, we're consuming <laughs> friendship to create the games. So you take your friendship cubes. And you um, put them on uh, the village space and turns it into board games. Yes, yes, pretty much. Oh, is that literally how it works? Man, I should... Yeah, it's just like, it's just like Charterstone. <laughs> I, is it like Hearthstone too, I guess, I hope? Uh, yeah, it's also like Hearthstone where the friendship recharges every turn. Oh my gosh. Okay, and up you your maximum more. friendship. I think it is, it is, it is kind of like that though, because like, yeah, you get... Um, you 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 know you get everybody to come in and help you, and uh, and then you make the thing, and mm-hmm. then you know you wait a bit, you come back, everybody's like, oh, let's do another thing, and then uh, also somebody new comes in and says, oh, I also want to be part of this. That's how crowdfunding is, right? Oh, and yeah. And then everybody gets together, we all make the next thing, and then we all wait and recharge, and then we make the next thing. And oh my gosh! So, so maybe it is more like Hearthstone than we're giving it credit for. Oh my gosh. Okay. You know what? That pretty much does it for your segment, Brad. I love your segment, but like, we're done. The moment we start saying that crowdfunding is hard stuff. Wait. <laughs> it's probably a pretty bad analogy, isn't it? Wait. But Hearthstone only exists because the masses give it money for packs, essentially funding the next expansion. Hearthstone is crowdfunding. And then when they when they dislike what Hearthstone does, they go online and they kick it. It's like kickstarted. Oh. Wait, no, that doesn't make any sense at all. Um, that was a bad analogy. Yeah, we were we were almost there. We were like conspiracy level theories, like X Files levels almost there. Hearthstone is crowdfunding. Hearthstone is crowdfunding. Secretly Hearthstone is Kickstarter. You just never knew. Everything everything in the world is crowdfunded. Or every product is crowdfunded. Are you sure? Except for except for things that are funded by only one person. I guess they're just rich funded. Well, but, no, they're solo funded, right? Yeah. Oh. Okay, but like, but in general, like, you make a product, a bunch of people buy the product, and that's how you justified making the product in the first place. 
everything is crowdfunding. So if people, okay, so the next time anyone complains about crowdfunding, just remind them, everything is crowdfunding. Your birth right. was a crowdfunding. Well, I don't know about all that. That's like... And technically... Okay, maybe just, maybe just civilization. <laughs> okay. Civilization just, just the fundamental, just civilization is crowdfunded. Um, what is what is what does Adam Smith call it? Like the, the the invisible hand? No, the like economization of labor. It's it's like it's where you know one person can make like one widget a day, but if three of them get together and just make a single part of the widget, they can make like a hundred in a day. Um, but each one of them is now dependent on the others to you know to complete the task. I have um, and so no that idea. that codependence is what creates like all economies of scale, and w- that's what enables civilization to exist. Mm, okay, sorry. When you said civilization, I thought you actually just meant um, the video Sid- game, Sid Meier's. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Okay. Anyway, um, other than that, so the the big thing is promoting Imperial. We've been doing lots of promotion. Um, every day we wake up, uh, talk to people online, uh, get get reviews you know, um, post new posts on the blog Mm -hmm. and, uh, well I say every day, but like we're, we're always making sure something is happening every day and, um, you know, and then the project will probably be launching in about two weeks. So I'm so excited. uh, I'm so excited. Yeah. Get hype. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be really cool. This is going to be our biggest game yet. I'm really excited for it. Is that literal? Um, well, maybe literal like the box is taller than millennium blades but it's not as long but it's the same height um it's eight pounds i think millennium blades is a little bit more than that but uh, uh, I'd, I'd say it's pretty yeah i'd say it's pretty big yeah i mean once you get the like expansions and stuff the game is like 20 pounds so 20 pounds oh yeah. my gosh you know what? Some of your games are heavy, Brad, but you know that just means they're jam-packed with fun for the whole right. family. Ah. I'm sounding like a bad commercial. Uh, Am I a bad commercial? <laughs> you Brad? are. Uh, no, you're you're a pretty decent commercial, Marco. Oh, thanks, Brad. That's literally like the fifth nicest thing someone said to me today. Oh, really? Yeah. You must have a lot of nice things said about you. See, nobody said anything nice about me this morning. Well, Brad, I find your conversation and your understanding of Adam Smith's economic principles to be quite shocking and quite amazing. I see. Well, um, let me uh, shock you and amaze you with uh, 99 questions. Ah, next segment. I'm shocked and amazed. I don't know. I- I'm sorry. I'm sorry I just did that thing. Man, Marco phones it in. Oh my gosh. Marco, phones it in. Am I the next character for Smash Brothers? <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, all right. All right. Okay, let's get to these questions, Brad. Welcome to the 99 question segment where I ask all of your all hard-pressed right. questions straight from your mouth into our ear right. gobs. So, first question, Marco. Brad does a great job at translating various video game themes and mechanics into board games. Are there any video game genres that you would find difficult to translate to a board game? Oh. Mm. I see you, you've turned this question around on me. Because originally I thought this was going to be a question for you. And then you made it into a question for me. Yeah, well the context clues made it pretty obvious that this is a question for you. Okay, um... I find it very hard to translate. I guess first-person shooters would be kind of hard to translate because everything would essentially just turn into a tactical shooter instead or like a tactical strategy-based shooter. So I guess that. I guess that would be really hard. Like, how would you even do first-person board games? That's kind of absurd. Well, did, I, did I tell you about Adrenaline, which we played a few weeks ago? Uh, I think like, you might have... Like, on a much earlier podcast. It's the game... It's a worker placement game where... Your workers are bullets, and you use your guns to place them out onto your opponent's bodies. Are you serious? Oh, yes. that sounds so rad! It's, it's so great. Um, it's like it's it's pretty good. It's pretty awesome. Oh my gosh, that sounds so cool. Okay, um, okay. So and yeah, the, the, yeah. The game has like thirty different guns. They're all they're all great. Thirty different guns. Oh my gosh. Wait, so does that mean like they have different... Okay, wait, so it's a bullet placement game. 
Oh my yeah. gosh. Okay, so I mean, guns can shoot different numbers of bullets. They take different kinds of ammo. Uh, some of them, like, there's like a wormhole generator that'll pull people in. There's a, um, like, you know, electroscythe that cuts through everybody in an adjacent space. You know, stuff like that. Oh, okay, I need to I need to search up this game. This sounds awesome. Yeah, it's called Adrenaline. Adrenaline it's by board Check game. Games Edition. Check Games? Check Games? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Um, how about you, Brad? How would you design a rhythm board game? Like, that's the extension of that first question. Haha, I turned it around yeah. on you. Um, rhythm board game? So I've done a couple of these, and, and like, I tried to do a couple of them in the past. Uh, rhythm board game is pretty tough. Um, I think it would either have to be some kind of push your luck, or some sort of, maybe a sort of push your luck deck builder would be what I would do for a rhythm board game. I have some ideas, and you might see, you might see a prototype in like the next year or so for a game like this because it's one that I'm thinking that I'm going to do in time. Oh, that's going to be so interesting. I, can we get <laughs> can we get the Persona license and like make it Persona boarding? Dan- Persona dancing all night. Dancing all board. Dancing on board. I, I dancing don't. on board. Yeah, right? <laughs> that's that's uh that's that dancing board night. Enough to dancing be, board night. Uh, Dancing board night. Okay, yeah, that seems that seems pretty. Uh, that seems like a persona type thing. Sure. Right, right, exactly. All right, here you go, Brad. Here's a question for you: The art on the bases, shot, strike, etc., on BattleCon Online are awesome. Are they going to be used for the bases in Devastation revised slash remastered? Um, no, I think we're going to keep the art the same in Devastation revised. Oh, so why it's so? Going to, it's gonna. It's going to be the same as it is in Trials. Um, because the Paper Battle Con has a... a once, we want to have consistency. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. I mean, we, we could use the art from Battle Con Online, like the style arts in Devastation Remastered too, but I think that would be a little too much given that there are already three games or four other games in the series that are not using art on, on all the cards. I see. When we when we tried to do this, we tried to do it back in the original Devastation project. We were like, hey, let's put different art on all the styles. And people were like, no, War has the same art on all the styles, so that's what we want. We want consistency. And I played a game yesterday where there was like a difference between the first and second edition that was really glaring. Um, we played Aeon's End, and we played with the first and second edition components mixed. And I was like, yeah, I kind of see what people mean. I kind of don't want to mix things up too much, because it's really jarring when you have two different card templates um in your game that both do the same thing oh okay that, like that's a big deal like if they're literally the same thing but they look different that's that's a yeah. bad that's a bad yeah and so the the way that the arts were structured for these kind of borderless art boxes that we have in battlecon paper which in battlecon online the art boxes are are fixed size and so we built art to fit in those frames if we changed, if we added that art to Devastation Revised, we would have to add frames, which would really change the look of the card. Yeah, because so I don't want to. I don't want to go down that road. Yeah. Okay. That that sounds absurd. I guess like it would change the look of everything. Look, I mean, like even small differences mean a lot, right? Like in, I I remember like in War versus Devastation, I think there's a small, 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 small difference in like the proportions of the cards and like. If you try to use a base set from one of the later sets with some of the earlier sets, it doesn't line up perfectly. There's like a small pixel difference. Yeah, it's very, very, very annoying to your OCD. Yeah, I mean, like, so if that alone is like super obvious to some people, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and we've done little revisions over the years, but I think it's probably for the best to just, you know, um, just keep it keep it similar. Do the improvements in the box and storage and stuff, and uh, you know, and in the balance of the cards. It is really fun to play with the new Marmalee, I have to say. Now that I've played her in the tournament. Oh, so, new Marms uh, is she's, so good. Yeah, she's much better. Um, and it's funny because she doesn't feel any different, um, but she does feel much better. Yeah, I think it, I think it has a lot to do with like how certain cards. I feel like certain cards were. How do I explain this? They weren't what they were supposed to be, but now they are. Yeah, I think that's that's probably probably a fair thing to say. Yeah, like nullifying used to not have retreat one start of beat on it when I felt like the entire time it was like it should have that, right? Like in my yeah. head. Yeah, it feels like this is the version that should have existed in yeah. the in the beginning. 
But anyway, let's move along to our right. final question. All right. Correct me if I'm wrong, but Argent University has some members who are active Gesselheimen, Hymian? Uh, Gessel, Gesselheimen, yeah, the, uh, from the southern nation. Like, Rexen is in, well, so Rexen is on, like, the Board of Trustees in Argent, for example. I see. Okay. Um, is Argent University a neutral ground, or are they also a player in politics and nation affairs? I want to understand the dynamic affairs between the nations, and is Rexen infamous throughout Indians, or only some of them? I'm looking at you, Luke, Vana, Seth, etc. So, um, the so Argent is a you know the school of magic. It's one of the places where new magic is invented in the world, which makes it a pretty important place. Um, the board of trustees is secret, and we don't actually know who is on there. But uh, it is said to be some of the most powerful and influential people in the world. So this is why the the voters of the consortium change every single game because the actual membership of the board of trustees is secret, and these are proposed some of the proposed people who could be on the board, um, who are Aww. you know who are showing up to vote, right? So Aww. that's, oh, that's, so, that's so that's the cool. lore behind the game, yeah. So we don't really actually know if any of these people or which of these people are on the board of trustees, right? But that's the that's the idea behind Arjun. Anyway, um, but it is it is sort of a neutral ground in that sense um, because you you know because you don't know who's actually in charge. But it's very much a you know it's very much political because anytime you have new power or new science, it's going to be you know politicized and used by people in power. So, so yes, it's neutral, but yes, it's also very uh, like internationally politically important location. I see. You know, I keep calling Argent like Harry Potter Euro game, when in reality, it feels like it's more Game of Thrones Euro game. Mm, maybe in the actual, I guess it's it's like Harry Potter in the thematics, and maybe it's more Game of Thrones in the execution. Yeah, and uh, like the lore, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but it, yeah, a lot of cutthroat backstabbing, that sort of thing. My gosh. All right. So, <laughs> hey, Brad, it's still kind of weird. I remember. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's like we always make well, this joke I... whenever we play, um, whenever we play Argent, but whenever like one of your kids gets sent to the infirmary, you get pr- consolation prizes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we always make that joke. It's like, you know, it's like, oh, I'll hurt my kid. To get some prizes. Oh my goodness. That sounds oh so goodness. bad, right? Oh my god. It's the worst. It's the worst. Marco, your mages are more valuable in the school than they are in the hospital. Except for Ricky. I think I was playing against a Ricky, which is why. Oh yeah, yeah. Ricky doesn't care. But she's she's really good if you have the immediate spaces, because you can get the economy twice out of the immediate spaces. Oh. Um, or no, that's that's Jessica. Jessica is really good with the immediate spaces. Ricky is just I don't know. Ricky's probably the hardest mage to play. Because she, um, like, spends... She, like, pings her own people for mana, right? That's what she does? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. That's pretty yeah. hard, because that means you have to draft correct spells. You have to draft the spells that are, like, high enough that it's worth to ping your guys to actually make that yeah. mana. So well, it's... So it's Yeah, it's definitely the kind of character that you need to control the flow of the game. And, uh... And she's she's really not uh, like a character like Byron. The only advantage Ricky has is like she sacrificed a guy, but she activates her spell quickly instead of uh, as a full action. Whereas Byron gets the same amount of mana without spinning a guy, but as a full action. Mm. So when you're doing that, you have to be able to really control Bell Tower um, in a in in that kind of situation. Anyway, but tact our tactics of Argent aside. Oh my god. Um, it's been a it's been a long episode. Might be about time we wrap things up. All right, Brad. Let's ra- 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 wrap things up. That was... My name is Brad, and I got a podcast. But now, at last, it's time to end the class. Oh, Marco, take it away. My name and we'll is. Wrap this thing up today. My name is Marco, and I'm here to say that we're ending this podcast in the major way. As usual, it's been me, Marco, your host. Also here, Brad, the other host. I am Brad, the other host. The, now it's time to end the podcast with the most. Yo, Yo toast. To, um, Lost. In this episode of the Level Gap Podcast, if you guys liked 
listening to us rap. Ho please, 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 please give us a like. Give us a comment in the comment section down below. Tell us everything you want us to do. I will probably respect you more if you don't give us a like. <laughs> hey, come uh, on. Just, just FYI. Brad, come but on. But no, thank you guys. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, it's Marco, it's been a lot, a lot of fun. fun. Oh, Brad, yep. you're a lot of fun. Well, we'll see you next time. We'll see you next time. And please, don't forget your special action. And thank you, World of Indians. Thank you. And good night. Toast. <laughs>